Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the machine known as Crown Countdown U. And we can't have a show without these guys, Gord Randall in Vancouver and Justin Dunk in Toronto. Now over to Andrew, who will tell us how McMaster pumped the brakes on the Mustang Yates Cup bandwagon just a little bit. Yeah, Jimmy, a win by McMaster in this one, and there would be chaos on the top end of the OUA standings board. We'll start in the first queue, and this wasn't the start the Purple Ponies anticipated. Chris Merchant's pass gets tipped. Aaron Clark gets his mitts on the leather, takes it back inside the Western Red Zone, but Mac only musters a single point out of it. Second queue, Western up 5-1. to one. They fake the punt and pick up some big yardage. That leads to a field goal, and it's now officially a one-score game. But minutes later, Mac Pivot Asher Hastings caps off a 76-yard drive with his goal line pledge. We got a tie ball game. But Western responds with its own 76-yard drive. That backup QB, Stevenson Bone, caps off. They'd add a field goal and hit the recess up by 10. Marauders open the second half with a bang. The defense forced a fumble in the Stang zone, and Hastings made them pay for it. He hits Mitch O'Connor from 35 yards out, or the major deficit is now cut to just three. But that's as close as Mac would come. Western seals up the top spot in the conference. After the game, head coach Greg Marshall, he praised his defense. <laughs> but but uh, that was, that was uh, you know, that was a great defensive effort. You know, I think that, that they did a good job, um, you know, on those third downs. Uh, the, the punt pig was big. You know, the thing is, we just lacked any flow. And give Matt credit, man, they brought like nine, ten guys. And, you know, we, we, we struggled, you know, to, to put the ball in a good spot. We struggled to keep our footing, you know, to, you know, they're giving us the short passes. You, you got to complete them with a high, high percentage. And, you know, we didn't do that today. So, you know, you mean, then you put yourselves in long situations and they're bringing eight, nine guys. You know, you got to make sure that, that you secure the catch. So lots of like little things that we did that we clean up. And I think, you know, um, Give credit to Mac, they're good defense, but uh, not our best offensive game. Over to Kingston now. Queens in a win, and they are in game versus Ottawa. Let's begin in the first queue. Opening series for the home side, and they put up points on the board. Nate Hobbs pushes his way in from a yard out at seven blank. Now Gales, their cheerleading squad, well, they love it. See, Gord Randall, they're still having some fun at Richardson. Second queue, Queens widens the gap some more. Eric Dodwell scoring from two yards out. It's now 16 nada for the Golden Gales. But this was no fun for Hobbs. He bobbles the leather and is forced to run. He injures his ankle in the process. His day is done. Second half, GG's cut the deficit to just six. But then we get a glimpse of Hobbs' understudy, Kyle Govea. The first year pivot connects with Matteo Del Bracco for the major. And bada boom, bada bing, the Gales lead grows to 13. But the conference's best QB wasn't going to be silent for too long. Derek Wendell replies with his deep score by Carter Matheson. And we got a gunfight on our hands now. In the fourth, the Gales look to put this game to bed. Wendell's pass gets tipped by Nicholas Fraser Green. NFG takes the pick into the fake blue paint for six. But Wendell executes a four-play, 75-yard drive on the very next series. He caps off the drive, calling his own number. Ottawa is right back in this, down just three. They force overtime. In the final session, the Gales score a major. The GGs reply with nothing on the line for Ottawa. They go for the win with a two-point conversion. It slips right through the hands of Jason Shema, 2-2. Oh, gosh, that's it for the Gales. GGs take it by one. To Guelph we go, where the Gales lost. Already guaranteed the Griffins the final seed in the postseason versus the lowly Lions. But the reigning Yates Cup champs, they weren't going to back down in this one. Guelph put up over 600 yards of offense, including an incredible 422 on the ground, led by Mac Jones and Johnny Augustine, who combined for 274 of those yards, with Augustine scoring the two majors. Let's head to Southern Ontario. Windsor wrapping up its season, hosting Laurier. Jihawk pivot Michael Neville tossed for close to 300 yards, connecting on 75% of his passes as Laurier secured a bye to the H Cup semis with a 31 point win over the Lance. So the quarterfinal matchups are now set in the race for the H Cup. It's a Panda game rematch in Ottawa where the Blackbirds 
are playing host to the GGs, while the reigning cup holders travel to the Hammer to face the Marauders. Going west now to the City of Champions where the Bisons were in search of a much needed road win, but it's the G-Bears who go to work early on. Ed, licensed to ill, Nikki picks up a big chunk of change with this run right here. That leads to this major as Ben Kaczynski hits Tyler Henry from 11 yards out. It's seven blank Alberta. Don't do the Superman, Tyler. You're better than that. Let's head though to overtime where the real magic went down. Seven overtime sessions to be exact where this was the dagger that finished it all. Riley Harrison, six yard pass from Teo Dizar made a four play, 35 yard drive complete as the Bison. Seven overtime, they're still alive, taking down the G-Bear. Sassy and Calgary coming off a big win last weekend over UBC. Calgary going with backup QB Adam Singera due to injury to Jimmy Underdahl and the rookie pivot was working it early on. Down 9-7 in the second, he connects with Brandon Thera for the major. CGY takes the lead, but not for long. Minutes later, Huskies pivot Kyle Siemens connects with Yoel Piok, and Piok puts the afterburners on. Takes it 65 yards to Paydirt, and Sasky holds a two-point edge going into the break. Second half, the doors blow wide open for the Green Dogs. They score 22 unanswered, with two majors coming from stud running back Tyler Chow. Calgary made a run late in the game, but they came up short. Sasky punches its ticket to the postseason with a three-point win. T-Birds in Regina, the reigning champs playoff hopes hanging by a thread. Second cue, UBC up four blank, but this 13-yard major from the Pictons, that's Noah to Mitchell, put the Rams up by three. Later in the queue, the T-Birds would tie it up with a field goal, but then Atlee Simon, oh my, what a catch. He takes it 28 yards. To the house party, Regina takes a six-point lead into the Pilsner break. To the fourth, Simon scores his second tutty of the game, putting the Rams up by nine. Under three minutes remaining, and Pickton, no one that is, well, he gets picked. Tanner Friesen with the thievery, and he takes that pick 56 yards later, turns it into six, seven with the extra point, and suddenly it's a two-point ball game. However, very next series, those pesky Pickton strike again. Noah over the middle to Cousin Mitch, and well, he does the rest. Takes it 70 yards all the way to the house. Rams go up by nine. The T-Birds would score this late major from Will Watson as Michael O'Connor drove his squad 79 yards into 52 seconds, but it was too little, too late, which may actually be the motto for UBC season. To the Maritimes we head next. X on the road to face the Axemen and the visitors made themselves at home on their second play of the game. We told you about this guy a few weeks ago, Jordan Shashalachuk, oh my, 71 yards to the house, it's seven to one for X. But in the second queue, Acadia scored 17 points. This major from Cody Kluett to Sean Robinson put the home side up by 10. They took a 14 point lead into the recess, but in the third, Shashalachuk scored his second major of the game on the six yard scamper. Right before the quarter closed, Devon Cook hit key on Julian Grant. We told you about this guy last week. He goes 35 yards to the house party. X gets a little bit of a scare, but they take it by four. Over to Sackville, and the Huskies were in tough against the Mounties. And this just wasn't SMU's day. MTA put up 26 of its 39 points in the second quarter alone as the Mounties cruise to an easy 30-point W. So Quebec, we go to wrap this reel up. We'll start in Montreal. McGill getting a massive win over Concordia. The win put the Redmen in the driver's seat for a playoff spot, while Concordia's route to the postseason, well, it's hanging in the back. Well, across town, the Ver A or were in tough against the reigning conference champs, and the Carabans held nothing back, scoring in double figures in the second and third quarters on route to a 25-point win. Sherbrooke now faces a must win on the road in Laval this weekend to keep their playoff hopes alive. All right, let's close this out at Peps, where the Gators upset the Rouge or come on, as if. The Red Machine won it six in a row, wrestling the Gators to a 44 to zero blowout. Hugo Richard connected on 84% of his passes, tossing for over 250 yards and three scores. Running back Sebastian Serra had a breakout game, rushing for 185 yards and the one score. Laval looking to be in top form heading into the final game of the RCQ regular season. Extra, extra, read all about it. 
Yes, now it's time for headlines and on very few occasions with the renaming and rebranding of the national organization take a backseat to a single game. But in this case, we are prepared to make an exception. Hashtag seven epics between Manitoba and the Alberta Golden Bears in a 67-59 win for the herd that keeps their playoff hopes very alive for them. Putting that missed field goal fest between Seattle and Arizona on Sunday night to shame on an entertainment scale, Justin. Well, it speaks to how exciting Canada West football and U-Sport football can be, in particular in the Ken West this week. We had a two-point game, a three-point game, and as you mentioned, a seven overtime game. So if you're out there looking for entertaining football and you don't want to watch a 6-6 tie with a bunch of missed field goals and three yards in a clouded dust type football, you should be tuning in to watch yours on that side of the room in Jim Mullen on Shaw because these Can West games have been spectacular all season long. Well, thanks for the free plug, Justin. But you know what? We had exciting football in the Canada West all across the weekend. All three games were fantastic. Yeah, and when you compare it to that NFL game that you brought up, Jim, that made me want to scoop my eyeballs out with a spoon, it was a fantastic weekend for the Canada West. And what is in the water in Edmonton right now? That's two weekends in a row that Alberta's put up uh, really interesting games at home. First taking down the first place Regina Rams, and then this ridiculous, and I mean ridiculous, game versus the Manitoba Bisons. And if you're a neutral observer in this country, you should be rooting hard for the Manitoba Bisons to make the playoffs because, Jim, Excitement just seems to follow these guys around. They've already been involved in a four overtime game and now a seven overtime game this year, both times scoring well north of 50 points. These guys are crazy. And you mentioned to me off the air, Jim, that they also were part of Canada West's all time highest point scoring game three years ago. Brian Doby, thank you for what you have done for me as a football fan because my goodness, is it fun to watch the Manitoba Bisons a lot of weeks. Okay, here's our sidebar. The CIS changes its name, kind of, because of the release time to U-Sport. I'm neither here nor there with this. Uh, I, I think it's kind of regrettable that they have to dump a name for the second time in 16 years, but what are your thoughts on it? Well, Jim, I've, I've actually kind of found myself defending this decision a little bit. Uh, I will say, though, that in talking to some current players, they're not entirely pleased with it because the name that they settled on is just... It, it's a miss for a lot of people. And I know some of the comments I got were like, it sounds like I'm playing in a rec league now when I tell people I play U Sports football. Uh, to me, it sounds like it could be a cheap Nintendo game. But I do think that a rebrand was sorely needed for the CIS. The fact of the matter being that, unfortunately, there are a lot of negative sentiments out there across the country about the CIS as a governing body. And if you can wipe the slate clean, which is what they're attempting to do here, and start anew, and, and Jim, we know that a lot, of the, a lot of the leadership at the top of this organization has changed over in the last couple of years as well. I don't mind the idea of getting a fresh start here. I'm not sure I love what they settled on, and I'm not sure that I love the timing. I mean, the fact that it's a, a side note on our show this week is indicative enough of the fact that maybe you sh shouldn't have tried to bury the lead with this, but nonetheless, I do think that overall this is actually a positive move for the, for the oh, I was going to say the CIS, for you sport, <laughs> um, and, and I think that this, this at least wipes the slate clean for the new regime there. Well, my thoughts initially are that I like the logo. It's slick, it's new age, it's modern, it should attract the attention of some of the younger kids that are going into the university schools, the millennials as everyone is calling them. But I do question the timing. That makes me scratch my head a little bit because we see the new logo being used on Twitter and social media by Usport, but yet we're still going to the CIS website. So I would have thought they would have rolled out an entire rebrand and the site would have been U-Sport as well and everything around it. Now I'm sure they wanted to get out and create some momentum, but to me, do that when you're fully ready to go. Justin, though, do you think that it might create some confusion? I know some people in TV that still refer to the CIS as the CIAU. Uh, changing names three times in 16 years, uh, does that give clarity to the product? Not really, Jim. There's still people that call the OUA the OUAA, and as you said, the CIAU, some of the older folks. So from that standpoint, it might certainly create some confusion, but hopefully this can be a name and a logo that going forward can be used for at least 16 years, if not longer, and really stand the test of time. You know, after a seven overtime game we're going to have a whole lot of weekend warriors and we're going to start in Edmonton and my guy is Tyler Henry the explosive receiver for the Alberta Golden Bears 
who tied the CIS record for receptions in a game with former Laurier Golden Hawk Andre Talbot's 19 set back in 2000. And he was also four off the Canada West yardage mark with 298 yards. And my guy is elsewhere in the Canada West. It's Mitchell Pickton. Stand on up. This guy is having a spectacular season. His line this past weekend, six catches, 134 yards and two touchdowns, one of which was of the highlight reel variety, a spectacular catch. And he is having a phenomenal season. He's basically a lock for first team all Canadian at this point. Coming into his last game with an outside shot at a rare thousand yard season, coming in with 56 receptions, 815 yards and 11 touchdowns, which ranks him third, second and first nationwide in those categories. This guy's having a phenomenal year. He can put the cherry on top with a big game this weekend where he emerged as the biggest weapon in the Canada West by far. Johnny B. Wall, the defensive end and long snapper for the Mustangs, had a big time play on special teams, not too often outside of Gord naming kickers weekend warriors, but I'm going with B. Wall because he made the big tackle in the end zone to get a rouge that put Western up 19 18 and gave them the number one overall seed in the OUA. Last week, St. FX posted a somewhat tongue in cheek thank you to Calgary on YouTube. I wonder if they have some love for Fort Mac after Jordan Sasalachuk went on another rampage. He scored a pair of TDs in X's 33-29 comeback win over Acadia on 27 carries for 223 total yards. He currently leads the AUS in rushing, averaging 132 yards a game with 925 yards total. And with one game left, he's on the edge of 1,000 yards. And he could be the first AUS player to do that since way back in 2007. Seven overtimes and Teo Dizar was on point in pretty much every period of this game. 393 passing yards, five touchdowns to get the victory for the Bisons as Manitoba stays in the playoff hunt out west in the longest game ever in Can West history. And my second warrior led the way in a big defensive performance by the McMaster Marauders, shutting down one of the highest scoring offenses in the country in the Western Mustangs, holding them just to 19 points. Now they lost that game, but that was still a statement victory for Mac, as Jim mentioned off the top of the show, where they slowed down the hype train and showed us that there is some hope for a competitive OUA playoffs. This guy, Hassan Barry, six and a half tackles, including two and a half sacks and two forced fumbles. He was a monster coming off the edge in this game and made a big impact from that defensive line spot. Next up, all his exes live on a video board. Hang on for Coach Olson. Crown Countdown U is supported by the Guelph Griffins, the defending Yates Cup champions. Cullen Cup is all set and ready to go on Southern Vancouver Island this weekend. The upstart West Shore Rebels and the defending champion Okanagan Sun. Prairie Conference, and it may have been ugly, but the Colts will take an 11-10 semifinal win over the Edmonton Huskies. Colton Burr had 15 tackles for the Colts, who offensively could only muster 85 yards passing. In the other semi, the Saskatoon Hilltops, led by veteran quarterback Jared Andrichuk's 204 yards passing, squeaked out a 25-24 win over their provincial rivals, the Regina Thunder. The Flatland final is set. Gordy Howe Bowl will host the Calgary Colts, traveling to Saskatoon to face the Toppers. Sejep highlights, that's right, Sejep highlights. Notre Dame de Foix clinching first place thanks in large part to the leg work by Glory Muganda. You heard right, Glory Muganda. 29 carries, 209 yards and three TDs in a 49-24 win over Garneau. So Notre Dame tops the standings in the D1 with the win. Welcome back to the studio, everyone. Time to get your strategy on with Coach Olson. <music> the 
This week, we're going to take a look at the OU way and one of the top quarterbacks in the nation and Derek Wendell of the GGs from the University of Ottawa. Let's take a look at this first clip. This first clip is going to highlight Derek's ability to make plays on the run, his patience in the pocket, and his ability with the strong arm to get down the field. Let's take a look here. Right here, you've got a nice open set. They like to play a lot of six receivers. You got one, two, three, four, five, and six. Really looking to spread the field. Now over here, this is where our first look is going to be. We're looking here at a quick out with two verticals. But this waggle is a little late. It's going to be an issue, and he's going to end up coming back to his secondary read, make some plays with his feet, and get the ball down the field on a go pattern to, to his big-time receiver, Mitchell Baines. Here we go. Let's roll it. Here it is. You got a waggle here, and let's pause it right there. We've got a, we've got a problem right here. You've got the quick out leading out the vertical clear out pattern. That's going to be a huge issue on that side of the concept. It's going to create Wendell to come off his first read, get back to the back side, and make a play with his feet. Let's roll the clip all the way. There he is looking right, nothing there, buying time. Look at the poise, creates space, gets his eyes down the field. Big time bomb down the sidelines to his favorite target, touchdown. This next clip is going to highlight Wendell's toughness in the pocket, his arm strength, and his poise under pressure. Let's take a look. Right here, you got a 41 set. You got four receivers over to the field here, one receiver to the boundary, one of their favorite sets. All this is going to be is a real simple hitch up pattern and a go. Wendell's taking a look here at the rotation of the safety into the middle of the field, and that tells him to look seam, but it's not there, and he checks it down to his deep wide side out. This is no joke of a throw. Let's roll the clip. Here's the rotation. Pause it right there. Take a look. This is what Wendell's seen. He's got his seam, but he's got a high defender over the top. He doesn't like that. Hangs in the pocket right there, under pressure. Defensive end bearing down on him and drives this ball out to the sidelines. 35, 38 yard throw to the sidelines. Impressive stuff. Let's roll it. Second read. Big hit, driven to the ground, gets the ball out there. Big time first down. Very, very impressive stuff from Derek Wendell. This last clip is going to be even more impressive. He's going to use his feet to create a huge play and a touchdown and do something that coaches tell you not to do all the time as a quarterback. Let's take a look. So here you go. You got them in a 41 set again. One of their favorite formations, four receivers. They're going to flood one side of the pattern and just run a simple vertical on the backside. You're going to see some really high quality quarterback play. Step up under the pressure, buy time with his feet, get to his second or third read, and then throw a bomb down the field. Let's take a look here, and you'll see something special. His eyes are to the four receiver side, vertical stretch, climbs, and let's pause it right there. Take a look. This is where he ends up going with his secondary read. Take a look front side first, secondary read. You're going to see him move with his feet to the right and then get his hips all the way around and throw a 35, 40-yard bomb right down the middle of the field. This is something that you get taught not to do as a quarterback as you're growing up. But the special ones can do it. Let's take a look. And here you go, deep ball, hip squared, super impressive stuff. Time for what we want to know, or Triple W2K. Now that the OUA playoffs are set, let's look at those left behind. So, Triple W2K, which OUA non-playoff team actually makes a move next year, Justin? You know, I'm not sure if Gord's going to like this or not based on his recent comments about his alma mater in Ontario, but I'm going to go with Queens. They have a couple nice pieces on both sides of the ball in Nelkis Cuemo, the linebacker, and in receiver Chris Osikusi, who I believe has all-Canadian type talent. They just need to find out if Nate Hobbs can be that guy or do they go out and find another quarterback. To me, the Gales are in a prime position to sort of strike again next year because this year they were pretty young. The team for me that's going to make the leap next year has to be the York Lions. And for Warren Craney, he needs to hope that it does because he brought in his big four from Calgary to large fanfare two years ago. And Brett Hunchak in particular took a huge step this year. Because of the importance of quarterback play in this conference, Hunchak almost single-handedly could lead these guys to a 4-4 four and four record next year in a playoff spot. And I believe that they are well positioned to do so. If they can add a supporting cast around him, aside from his brother Colton, then they are in even better shape and could actually be a giant killer in this conference next year. Watch out for the York Lions, who hopefully can take that big step back into relevance that they have been looking for for the better part of 20 years now. Triple W 2K, how is the Canada West going to sort itself out here in the last week? You know, UBC is a team where the football gods treated them very well last year, not so much this year. 
Yeah, they may not have, Jim. However, they have caught a break going into this one as they get a Calgary Dinos team coming into town, having lost no fewer than nine starters to injury the past couple weeks. And that list includes their starting quarterback, their starting running back, three of their starting offensive linemen, as well as the CFL draft pick in Brennan Van Nistelrooy in the defensive backfield. And that presents a huge opportunity for this UBC team, especially given that Calgary has a playoff spot quite solidified at this point in time. Now, a lot hinges on that Saskatchewan-Alberta game on Friday night. And if that game goes in the favor of the Saskatchewan Huskies, then UBC has the ball in its court with regards to tiebreaker because it holds the tiebreaker over Manitoba. However, if Alberta keeps their recent hot streak going and manages to pull one off in Saskatoon, then there's a potential for a three-way tie. And in, a, in the case of a three-way tie, UBC now becomes the odd team out. So it's a, a convoluted scenario. The way I see it playing out, I don't see Alberta having enough to take down Saskatchewan. So unfortunately, those high-flying Manitoba Bisons are going to be the odd team out, in my opinion. But it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out with all three games in the C-Dub having playoff implications this week. To think that the defending national champions could be outside the playoffs with a win or a loss is pretty crazy when you look at the scenarios in Can West. And further to that, Blake Nill has only had one losing season in his 19 years of coaching CIS football. That was his first at Calgary. So this is very interesting that UBC, you know, they could even route their opponent this week at home in Calgary and not make the playoffs at 4-4 four four after going on that magical run to the Vanier in 2015. Ottawa and Carleton set for a rematch in the playoffs without the big stadium, without the annual hype machine. So, Triple W2K, how will the win or go home game compare to the rivalry event, Justin? Here's the trouble, Jim. There's no Pedro. I think that's the problem here is that on the line in this game is do or die, but there's no Pedro. I mean, all jokes aside... I think this game should be pretty well attended. It's on the campus at Carleton. That program has generated a lot of momentum. Steve Samara has done a great job getting, to, getting them to this point in just four short years where they're hosting a home playoff game in the OUA. So I think it'll be pretty well attended at MMP Park. Well, Jim, you touched on it, and without months of buildup and hype and organization, as well as without the venue at TD Place, I mean, I don't think it's a fair expectation to expect this to completely live up to the off-field atmosphere of the original Panda game. But that being said, if you're Carlton, you must be pumped for this, especially if you are in their athletic department, because this is the best case scenario for you. And I expect with Carlton hosting this game that they will fill that stadium with supporters, as long as everybody's willing to make the crosstown trek from you, Ottawa. But this game is going to be a fantastic atmosphere. Nonetheless, even if it doesn't quite live up to the original and the two teams on the field Ottawa reeling a little bit but there's potential for some serious fireworks in this one so this should be a fun one Jim so we've got the Wild West in the final week we've got the first week of the OUA playoffs hey everybody let's get out to the game <laughs> <laughs> 